Hey guys, Nick from Arch City Poker and ArchCityPLO.com. Obviously, if you are a site subscriber, then you have access to this video and you're going to have access to future videos uh, on this page, the step-by-step -step process. I believe this is going to be the main staple of this site moving forward. I think what sets or what will set this site apart from the other sites is that there aren't a lot of videos or really any out there that I've seen that break down how to think during a hand in a systematic approach, step by step. Can we use these steps in each and every hand to really help our decision making process? And I believe that we can. Now, for you YouTube subscribers that are watching this video, you're going to have access to this one. Uh, I wanted you guys last week to see uh, a little bit of a breakdown for the step by step process for a no limit hand. I decided to give you a little PLO breakdown as well and in, in what the guys on the site are getting when they subscribe, when you sign up for that subscription. Uh, in the future, though, YouTube videos will be not consisting of this. Uh, these guys are going to pay for this content since it is a little more in depth, a little more advanced. So I am glad to bring this to all of you guys that have access to this now. And you're going to see in the little blurb, wherever I put it in the video here, that uh, the four steps are going to be listed so that we can always see what those are. But let's get into this hand and uh, break it down. So PLO, for you no limit guys, you're going to get a little um, insight into this game. For you PLO guys, you'll obviously enjoy this, but let's go through this step by step. So first step, pre-flop decision. We get a raise from, you know, technically the hijack, but we'll call it uh, under the gun in this five-handed game that I'm in. This is an, a $0.50 cent dollar online game uh, hand from my database. And we get, uh, or there's a couple callers, uh, one in position from the cutoff, one from the small blind. Those are typically going to be too loose of ranges from what I see from unknowns and the low stakes population. So first step, my pre-flop decision. My hand uh, looks probably decently pretty to a lot of you no limit guys. For PLO, this is actually a pretty decent hand. Uh, when we are, when we have a high level of confidence that we're going to end up in a multi-way pot in PLO, we need to have nuttiness, meaning we need to have cards that allow us to either flop the nuts or draw to the nuts. So, do we qualify with this hand? Nut suit, pair that can make a set, ace 5-4 is connected on wheel textures where we can make straights, and double suitedness doesn't hurt. Yes, the five high suit is not great, but it is uh, possibly a little bit of a backup plan. If we need to block big diamond draws when we have sets or two pairs, it's nice to have those as well. So, all in all, there are a lot of really good qualities, a lot of nutty qualities to this hand that make me believe I should definitely be continuing here. Now, should I 3-bet? Well, against tough players in a tough population, I probably would squeeze with this hand some of the time. Uh, it would be nice to show up with some lower-ranking cards like this on lighter textures like 6-5 deuce, 7-4-3, stuff like that. But against low-stakes populations, we don't really need to worry about balance as much. Uh, we really should focus on, I think, making plays that are exploitative in nature. Um, and I think being out of position, knowing that these guys are never folding, I would like to just have higher ranking cards, just a better hand in general. So it's too strong to fold. Maybe not the best hand to 3-bet with these guys. Call is going to be the right play, in my opinion. Preflop, so step one, preflop decision. I feel very confident in that. Go ahead and go with the call. Stack to pot ratio is going to be step two. So multi-way, it is a little trickier, but it can still be simplified. First thing I look at is the preflop aggressor because he's the one that I think it matters with the most. He's the one that we would have possibly implied odds on or with rather, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, about six and a half here, we go by the, uh, the effectively most shallow stack. So my stack size divided by the pot. About six and a half with this player. I would say with this hand, I don't feel that great being committed with that high of an SPR. The thing that we need to keep in mind as well, guys, is multi-way. You need to narrow your range with which you're willing to commit with, with the SPR. So heads up at six and a half. Could be situational if he's a looser player. I could potentially semi-bluff with this hand, be committed, feel like it's a profitable play. But if this player is taking an aggressive line multi-way, that's going to narrow his range to where he's usually a lot stronger. He should be a lot more polarized, 
but they don't have as many bluffs. If they are bluffing, it's usually a semi-bluff with like the nut flush draw. I'm going to block that, obviously. So if he takes an aggressive line, he's usually much stronger. I need to probably narrow my range with which I'm willing to commit with in a multi-way pot. So SPR with him, about 6.5, about 7.5 with this player. And, you know, obviously a little bit shorter or a little bit uh, smaller, lower of an SPR, if you will, with this player. I probably could commit with my hand with his stack size. But the most important is going to be the preflop aggressor. It is good to know where you're at with the other players. When you're heads up, it's obviously a lot easier to figure out. But stack to pot ratio, I have a good idea that with these two players, I probably don't want to commit just yet. With this player, I could commit on the flop. If there is aggressive multi-way action... I also probably do not want to commit just yet. But we'll evaluate it, and we'll see where we go. So I have a pretty good idea of how I want to play this hand. It seems like I do want to see turns and rivers, perhaps, but I don't want to get all in on the flop. So that's how the stack-to-pot ratio is going to help us out. It's kind of like an aid or a crutch, if you will. So that's step two. Step three, range or polarity advantage. So preflop aggressor is going to have a little bit of that here, considering that nobody... Uh, None of us three that called him in this hand, we didn't three bet. So we don't have some of the double suited high ranking rundowns that could give us a lot of like top two pairs. We probably don't have as much top set as well. Uh, a lot of players will three bet some double suited king, some ace king king, even like some ace jack jack. So this player has all of those hands, whereas us three do not have quite as many of those. So in this situation, especially with higher ranking cards, that's going to favor usually the out of position preflop aggressor. Anybody that cold calls uh, that's not on the button, that's in position, he's uh, going to have probably a little bit of those higher ranking cards as well. Small blind and big blind, we small blind should have more. They call a little bit too wide, so we don't have as many. But you know, as far as PLO is concerned, guys, the equities run a little bit closer. This player may have a slight range advantage, but it's not going to be really too big of one over the rest of us three. The equities are going to run pretty close together. So it's kind of murky here, isn't it? Like if it's unclear that he, or if it's clear that he doesn't have a massive range advantage, right? Then maybe one of us three could do some betting or take some kind of aggressive action. The fourth and final step, though, if I'm not really that clear, and I would take this step anyways, guys, and this is, I think, possibly the most important one, is where am I at within my range? So this hand, nut flush draw, bottom pair, the fours are not really all that relevant other than just ace four as a backdoor gutter. The ace as an overcard, probably not... Probably not counting that as an out as often because an ace fills the Broadway straight. There's going to be a fair amount of queen 10 collectively in their ranges. So, you know, I do have with the nut flush draw, I think enough equity with the pair as well and the backdoor gutter that this hand probably is worth continuing as long as I don't see like a bet, bet, raise, bet, raise, um check, bet, raise. You don't want to see essentially two bets before you in this spot because then we probably do not have the equity to continue. We're not going to have the pot odds to continue. So we'll go ahead and evaluate their action. I do decide to check. I don't think leading with this hand makes a lot of sense. Where am I at within my range? I feel like it's pretty middling. Like when you have just a nut flush draw on PLO and not a whole lot else going for it, it's going to be pretty much in the middle of your range. So the way that you want to think about this, guys, and I covered this in last week's video, if you're in the top 33% of your range, like if you can guesstimate that you're probably in the top third of your range, you could very well have a value bet. There might still be some checks, but if you're in the middle third, it's probably a hand that you want to check and call with a lot of the time. Uh, check back if you're in position. If you're in the bottom third, you're going to have to decide if you have a good bluffing candidate or if you have a hand that's just going to be folded. So I feel like this hand is pretty squarely in the middle third of my range. I want to start with a check here. I don't want to bet here and face a raise. That's not really the best situation with this hand. So I do, I do go ahead and check. And like I said, guys, multi-way, they are going to be a lot more straightforward. He bets pot. This is very likely, very usually a pretty strong hand. I would say this is generally at least two pairs. If it's not, it's a lot of combo draws, like top pair and a flush draw. Uh, could be nut wrap, 
even without a flush drawer pair, these guys will overvalue that just dry wrap, I would call it. Uh, but if he has like a nut wrap in a flush draw, nut wrap, you know, in a king, then the hand's a little bit stronger. But he does go ahead and bet. And the small blind's going to call for pot as well. So knowing that I'm kind of in the middle of my range here, do I have enough equity to continue? Uh, I only need about 25%. I'm getting 3 to 1 on my money. The way that we can do this simple math, guys, is that most players will count my 9 flush outs minus the board pair uh, with the 5 of hearts, so let's say 8 hearts. Yeah, technically we should count all of those, but if there's a bet and another player drawing in PLO, it's likely that I don't have as many of those heart outs. So I would say it's probably somewhere around actually 6 to 7 outs for my flush. The two fours, I think, are live most of the time. So if we call it roughly eight outs, times that by four, uh, having two streets left, if I was on the turn, you can multiply it by two. But the eight outs times four, it's going to give me about 32, 34% equity. I probably have clearly enough equity in this spot. I don't have a strong enough hand to raise as like a value raise. And it's probably a little bit too strong to bluff with, though. It's really definitely in the middle of my range at this point. There also could be some implied odds if I hit my heart. I could stack a player with a better flush. If I hit one of my fours, that's pretty deceptive as well. So I do go ahead and call. And, you know, again, going back to SPR, I didn't want to overcommit in the spot with these guys when 6.5, SPR 7.5, I don't feel that this is a spot that I need to balance too much with semi bluffs with these guys. I just want to see a turn, evaluate the action, and go from there. So pretty amazing turn for the most part, one of the rare fours that comes up. I don't decide to lead at this point because if this player pots it multiway on this kind of texture, I am very clearly expecting him to bet again. That could also possibly keep this player in the pot because if I lead now, it might remove some of his rare bluffs that he has. It also might look so strong that this player doesn't continue with worse draws. So I do go ahead and check. And very weird bet. This is pretty transparently weak. Uh, so this is one of the rare times I don't think he's quite as strong. But the nice thing about it is you will more than likely get action from this player now. He might even be induced to raise. And I think with a much lower SPR on the turn, I think SPR, we usually want to use that mainly as a flop aid, but it still can help you realize, you know, your commitment level on the turn. Clearly, there's not a lot of money left in my stack here. There's really no point in calling. I want to go ahead and get max value with this hand. It could also look like I'm attacking weak bets, so I can probably rep quite a few bluffs here. It's a really good spot to go ahead and commit. So... This player folds. I'm not really that surprised by this. Uh, that's a pretty weak turn bet. As I said, multi-way, they're a little bit more straightforward. I think this player's clearly drawing now. He had every opportunity to check-raise uh, flop, check-raise turn. I think that we are in really good shape here. So yeah, you can see clearly he was drawing, had the gutter, had a weak flush draw, um, had the pair in very good shape, pretty much have him drawing close to dead uh, on the turn there. So yeah, there's a lot going on there because it's a multi-way hand, guys, but remember the four steps. Pre-flop decision. I decided, if I can get back to the beginning here, I haven't used my database in a while, that I had the nuttiness to continue in this spot. Didn't feel like the hand was strong enough to three bet. Step two, figured out the SPR. Decided I did not want to commit all in on the flop with these two, but I could with this player. So let's say he checks, he pots it, he folds, like I said, guys, they're usually much more straightforward in multi-way pots. If the pre-flop aggressor checks on this board, he likely doesn't want anything to do with this hand. I could go ahead and check raise here and just commit with this player. I could call. It's debatable. But the point is, is I could argue that I'm committed to this stack with this hand and that much equity. With these two, I didn't feel that committed. So that's how I used the SPR for step two. Step three, decided I did not have the range or polarity advantage here. Again, range advantage, who has more strength in their in their range, who simply has more of the better hands in their range. It's usually going to be the pre-flop aggressor. Uh, it can be other players. It's going to be a little bit rarer. In PLO, it's, uh, it happens a little bit more often where it's not the pre-flop aggressor than a no limit, simply because the equities pre-flop run a lot, or pre- and post-flop run a lot closer together. 
polarity advantage again is who just has more nutty combos in their range. And again, it's usually the preflop aggressor. For example, he has more top set, probably more two pairs. I would have three bet some hands that have those, so we got to remove some of those from my range. Whoever has the range or polarity advantage, they usually can take more aggressive actions, and they should. So I determined that because I don't have the range advantage, but then more importantly, moving on to step four, where am I at within my range? I'm too much in, I'm too far in the middle of my range, guys. Like when I'm in that middle third, I don't really want to take aggressive actions all that often. You really only invite hands that are either probably crushing you or flipping with you. It's good to have a little more polarity to your strategy and take the combos in the middle third. Look to check call them more often if you're in doubt. Look to check them back. That's going to be a really solid strategy when you're not 100% sure what to do. So I determined that I don't have the range advantage, don't have the polarity advantage. I'm in the middle of my range. That was step four. This is a hand that I want to play slower. I'm not committed to these guys' as stacks. I would like to evaluate the action and likely see a turn. So I check, follow through with that. There's the bet. There's the call. I go ahead and call. And then felt committed, obviously, on the turn now being able to stack off with a hand that's now very much at the top of my range. So hopefully that is, uh, you know, something that you guys will be interested in. If you're a YouTube subscriber, you want to sub uh, subscribe on the site for a paid subscription. I'm going to be posting these types of videos weekly for you guys on the website that are in fact paid subscribers. They're not going to be as long as this video. The only reason this first one was longer is it is technically the first one for the site. I also wanted to explain some things, uh, a little more in depth as to why we're going through the step-by-step -step process. Obviously, I had to explain some stuff for the YouTube subscribers as well. So these videos, uh, they're going to be a little bit quicker. I'm going to try to keep them 10 minutes to 15 max on the site. And I think they're going to be really informative. I'm going to mix in some um, pots where I'm heads up in PLO. going to mix in No Limit as well. And uh, have some multi-way pots for No Limit as well, of course. But yeah. We're always going to follow this step-by-step -step process, pre-flop decisions, stack to pot ratio, range and or polarity advantage. And then fourth, like I said, possibly the most important to me, guys, where are we at within our range? If you're in the top third and you guesstimate you're in that top third, you're not sure what to do in the hand, you very likely have a hand that you could value bet. You could possibly check. Um, that's getting a little more advanced. We ta I talk about that stuff on the site and other videos. If you're in the middle third, it's very likely that you probably should check call or just call against a lead or just check back. You really don't want to take as aggressive of a line with hands that are in that middle third. The bottom third, if you have a good bluffing candidate, then you probably want to take a more aggressive line. But if you have a hand that really just doesn't have any equity or it just isn't a good bluffing candidate, you're probably looking just to give up. So you can really simplify this game, guys. The thing is, you're not going to take the best line always. But if you use this step-by-step -step process, it's going to really help you figure out how to think during the hand, and it's going to help you uh, become a lot more efficient, become a lot more confident in your decision-making, and that will ultimately lead to more winning and more fun. So apologies for the length of this video. Like I said, um, next week is actually going to be when I talk about, uh, for you YouTube subscribers, uh, how to adapt to shorthanded play during the pandemic since uh, if some rooms are opening they're opening shorthanded tables only so that video was delayed i'll talk about that next thursday for you site members obviously there's going to be more content coming in weekly especially with the step-by-step -step process here and uh i'll see you guys for uh, youtube subscribers again next week for you site members obviously you're going to see me a bunch uh within your paid subscription so uh thank you and take care Thank you.